I invite your attention to Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. I speak to you today on the subject, What kind of a death did Jesus die? Reading from Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet pure adventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. What kind of death did Jesus die? What was the death of the cross? Paul explains it. The cross in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now underline those two words, Him crucified. That's the meaning of the cross. The meaning of the cross is Jesus was crucified. What do we mean by the cross? Some people make the mistake of worshiping the cross instead of the Savior who died on the cross. And when the Bible speaks of the preaching of the cross, when the Bible speaks of the cross, it's speaking of the work that Jesus did on that cross. The cross itself will not save you. It is the Christ who died upon the cross who saves us from our sins. And I have seen people wear big crosses around their neck and know nothing about the death of Jesus Christ upon the cross. My friend, if you are clinging to the cross instead of the Savior who died on the cross, you have missed it. It is not that piece of wood that takes away your sins. It is the Savior who died upon that cross that takes away your sin. He had to die upon the cross. It was essential that He die the death of crucifixion. But we must remember that there is no saving grace in the piece of wood upon which Jesus died. The saving grace is in the death that He died for us. Now we need to be clear about that because some people have made the mistake of worshiping the piece of wood instead of the Redeemer. So what is the cross? The cross is the substitutionary death of the Savior upon the cross. And that's why Paul said, I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's where your salvation lies. In the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the death that He died, there we find our salvation. The word for cross is staros in the Greek language. You know the New Testament was written in the Greek language. It was not written in English. And they translated the word staros into the word cross. So we could understand it. But the word was staros. And it means a stake upon which Jesus was nailed. He was not nailed to a Latin cross which has been planed so carefully. No, He was nailed to a tree, Peter says. Him ye slew and hanged upon a tree. They cut an old tree down in the forest. 
and put a limb across it and hung him upon that tree. And on that tree, Jesus died for our sins. Now the question, what kind of a death did He die? First of all, He died a voluntary death. Jesus said, No man taketh my life from me, I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This I received of my Father. So Jesus was not a martyr to a cause. Jesus willingly went to the cross, willingly laid His life down for you and I that we might be saved. So it was a voluntary death. In the second place, it was a substitutionary death. Christ died for our sins. Now the Greek word for is from the Greek huper. And it means on the behalf of. He died on the behalf of His people. He laid His life down for His people on the cross of Calvary. It was a substitution. He took our place. He stood in our shoes. He bore our judgment. He carried our sorrows. Jesus took our place upon the cross. And the death He died was a death that I deserve to die. The sins He took upon Himself were the sins that I had committed. Jesus had no sin of His own. He bore our sin upon the cross of Calvary. Thirdly, it was a satisfying death. For Jesus did make a satisfaction according to the prophet Isaiah. What did He satisfy? First, He satisfied the broken law, the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not commit adultery. And those Ten Commandments constitute the moral law of God. And all of us have broken that law. And the wages of sin is death. But Jesus never broke that law. And when He went to the cross of Calvary, He kept the law perfectly while on earth. And on the cross, He died to pay the penalty of that broken law so that I would not have to pay that penalty. He satisfied the broken law. And then He satisfied the justice of God. You see, man has sinned against God. And God demands punishment for sin. And Jesus satisfied God's justice by dying in our place. Thirdly, He died a redeeming death. We were in the slave market of sin. We were held bondage by sin. The chains of sin were around us. Jesus came and snapped the chains and set us free. And we are free today from the power of sin, from the power of Satan. We are free because Jesus set us free. By His death on the cross, He broke Satan's power over men. It was a redeeming death. He redeemed us from sin and death and judgment. And then in the fifth place, it was a limited death. For whom did Jesus die? Jesus died for His people. That's what the Bible says. The angels came that night that Jesus was born. And He said, For thou shalt call His name Jesus, for He shall save His people from their sins. Now if you're one of God's people, His intention is to save you. And He can save you, and He will save you. He died to save His people. It was a limited death. If He had died for every person in the world, then every person in the world would have been saved. Because Jesus said, I give my life for the sheep. Then He said to those Pharisees, but ye are not of my sheep. He plainly limited His death to the sheep. Who are the sheep? The sheep are those that He chose in electing grace before the foundation of the world. 
For many years, I was a sheep, but I was a lost sheep. And Jesus came and found me. I didn't find Him. He wasn't lost. I was lost. Mm -hmm. He found me. And I'm so glad that He found me one night. Found me a sinner. Lost and undone. And He gathered me up in His arms and took me to Himself and made me a child of God. So it was a limited death. I lay down my life, He said, for the sheep. And ye are not of my sheep, he said. You see, if they had been of his sheep, they would have believed on him. But they did not believe on him because they were not his sheep. He came to bring salvation to his sheep. And then in the next place, it was a loving death. Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now you know a man might give you part of his money. He might share his automobile with you. He might give you a lot of things, but he's not going to give you his life. But Jesus gave his life. He laid his life down on the cross for sinners like you and I. It was a loving death. It was love that brought him to Calvary. It was not the nails that held him there. He said, I can call 10,000 angels to my side if I wish. But what held him on the cross was the love that he had for his people. He would die for them. He chose to die for them. He said, I must go to Jerusalem and I am straightened until it is accomplished. He came on a mission. And that mission was to save his people, his sheep. Then it was a reconciling death. By that death, He reconciled us to God. To God the Father. And you, Colossians 1.22, hath He reconciled in the body of His flesh through death. Through His death, He reconciled His people. And then it was a suffering death. Jesus suffered as no other man has ever suffered. He suffered in body as He hung on the cross under the cruel nails. He cried, I thirst. Under the boiling hot sun, having been a couple of days without food and drink, having been beaten and whipped with a Roman whip until His body was lacerated, until the blood ran down His cheeks, the nail-pierced crown was placed upon His brow. And as the suffering Savior hangs upon the cross, He cries, I thirst. You know why He said, I thirst? Well, first of all, because He had had no water. But in the second place, so that we would never thirst. The rich man in hell thirsted for a drink of water, and he never got it, for there's no water in hell. When Jesus thirsted on the cross, He was taking our death. And then He suffered also in His soul. Not only a physical death, but it was a death in the soul. He said, My God, My God, why hast Thou forsaken Me? I got a letter from a young lady who asked the question. Why did Jesus ask that question? I wrote her back and I said He asked that question because if He had not been forsaken of God, I would have had to have been. If the Father had not turned His face away from Him on the cross, then He would have had to turn His face away from me. For there on the cross, he bore in His own body our sins upon the tree. And when the holy God of heaven looked down upon Him and saw Him made sin, He had to turn His face away. And He caused the anguish cry, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken Me? Now Jesus knew the answer to that question. But He asked it for our benefit. 
Well, we might know that He was forsaken of God so that we wouldn't have to be. The Father will not forsake His people because Jesus was forsaken for them for a moment. And then if you read through Isaiah 53, you'll find that that was only a brief moment and then it passed and there was a cry of triumph from the lips of the Savior. It is finished. What did He mean? On the cross, He had finished the work of redemption for His people. He died in their place that they might be saved. And it's all finished. Now there's nothing you can add to what is finished. If it's finished, you can't add to it. And on the cross, He cried, It is finished. He had finished the work of redemption. He had paid the payment, the ransom price, to redeem us. And there on the cross, in His death, He redeemed His people. I would like for you to look carefully at Romans 5.10. For in Romans 5.10, it is a verse that I cannot get away from. It burns through my soul day after day. That glorious verse, Romans 5.10. I pray that you take that verse and think about it and meditate on it and, and worry about it and wonder about it and work it into your soul until it breaks upon your soul what Jesus did for you on the cross of Calvary. Then it was a propitiating death. Romans 3 verse 25 says, For whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. Now, a propitiation is something that pays the debt and turns away the wrath of God from His people. In Numbers chapter 16, we have the story of the people who rebelled against the high priest Aaron. And God's anger came down upon Israel. And He sent a plague upon the nation. And Moses, when he saw what had happened, said, take a censer and put fire thereon from the altar and go quickly unto the congregation and make an atonement for them. That is, a propitiation. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord and the plague has begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, a plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. That's a reconciliation. And he stood between the dead and the living. And the plague was stayed. Now when Aaron made an atonement to God, he stood between the dead and the living. And the plague was stopped. Jesus stood between us and our sins on the cross. And the plague of sin is stayed. He gives us grace to win out over sin. And He made an atonement for our souls upon the cross. He stood between us and the wrath of God and bore it away in His own body on the tree. Now, there are five elements involved in the death of Christ. Five elements of His atonement which made it acceptable unto God. And these five elements had to be present in the death of Christ. Let me re relate them to you quickly. The first one speaks of Jesus as the Lamb of history. If you go back to Genesis chapter 22 and verse 13, it speaks of substitution. For there Abraham takes Isaac up on Mount Moriah and he lays him up on the altar as God had bidden him to do. And he raises the knife to plunge it into Isaac for an offering unto God. And God stays his hand and says, Wait, Abraham, now I know that thou lovest me seeing thou hast not withheld thine only son from me. Look yonder in the thicket. And there in the thicket was a ram, a male lamb, caught 
caught in the thicket of a thorn bush. And he was caught by his thorns. <clears throat> and he couldn't back out. The thorns were holding him. And God said, you take that ram and offer it in the stead of Isaac. And I see that picture in my mind of that ram caught in that thicket to die in the place of Isaac as a substitute. Then I remember how Jesus, the Lamb of God, was crowned with thorns and He couldn't back out. He couldn't turn away. He had come on that mission and He would fulfill that mission. And there you have a thorn-crowned ram. That was Abraham's ram. And Jesus is our ram. Our thorn-crowned Savior. The first element was substitution. Jesus dying in our place. The picture there of Genesis 22. Then secondly, there's the lamb of ritual. It speaks of representation. In Exodus chapter 12, when they had the first Passover, over 200,000 lambs were slain. Their blood was shed as a type of the Lamb of God who would come and shed His blood for the remission of our sins. Thirdly, there was that is the Lamb of representation. Thirdly, there is the Lamb of prophecy. That is the Lamb of identification. In Isaiah 53, it says, Surely He was oppressed, He was afflicted, yet He opened not His mouth. He is brought as a Lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb so open he not his mouth notice the lamb is termed as he and his mouth <coughs> and then in Isaiah 53 4 and 5 surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And by His stripes we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to His own way. And the Lord Jehovah hath laid on Him the iniquity of us all. In John 1.29, as John the Baptist was baptizing people in the Jordan River, Jesus approached John for baptism. And John looked up, and when he saw Jesus, he pointed a long finger at Jesus and cried, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Multiplied thousands upon thousands of lambs had been offered throughout the Old Testament. And they all culminated in this one Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. I used to wonder, why did God call Him the Lamb of God? It's because He represents all those sacrifices of the Old Testament. He's the embodiment of all that we read in the Old Testament about a Savior. The thought of identification is fittingly expressed by John Cumming who wrote our sins on Him brought Him an accursed death but by a beautiful transfer of His righteousness upon us <clears throat> excuse me, lifts us to everlasting glory. When Jesus died upon the cross, <clears throat> there was nothing in Him worthy of death. And when I shall be admitted into heaven, there will be nothing in me worthy of heaven. <clears throat> Jesus died for sinners. And you know, as I look at that cross, and I see Jesus hanging there between heaven and earth, dying for me, as if I were the only person in all the world. And as he's dying there, I gaze upon that scene again and again. <clears throat> Reminds me of an old black hymnal. It goes like this. 
Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? If you're one of His people, you were there. You were there in your representative, Jesus. You were there in your substitute, the Lord Jesus. Were you there when they laid Him in the tomb? Were you there when they laid Him in the tomb? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid Him in the tomb? Were you there when they raised Him from the dead? Were you there when they raised Him from the dead? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid Him in the grave? Oh, I was there. I was there in my representative. I was there in my substitute. And I am united with Him. And nothing can ever separate me from Him. He is mine and mine forever. He is my Redeemer. And then quickly, <clears throat> He is the Lamb of reality. There's an element of satisfaction that had to be present. He satisfied the law of God, the wrath of God, the justice of God. And Isaiah said, He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. And then it pays an unsatisfied sin debt. You see, sin is likened in the Bible to a debt. And it's an old debt. A very old debt. The foundation of this debt was laid in the fall of Adam in the Garden of Eden, when Adam sinned against God, we were all born in debt. The government of America tells us that every child, baby, born into the world is born in debt to the government. We were born in debt in the fall of Adam. I came into this world in debt. And I was in debt for many years until the Lord paid my debt and set me free. I have a plaque in my office. And in, on that plaque it reads, it has a picture of a, of a crown of thorns behind a red velvet cloth. And there underneath it says, Jesus paid a debt He didn't owe because I had a debt I couldn't pay. My debt loomed up before me the night I was saved. As the preacher preached the gospel, I saw my sins loom before me like a mountain. And I could never overcome that. I could never pay that debt. But Jesus paid it for me. He is the Lamb of arbitration. There's an element of mediation. Somebody had to come between God the Father and me if I'm to be saved. And there's no one on earth that could die for me. My mother could not die for me. My father could not die for me. My friends could not die for me. But if I am to be saved, somebody must come between God and me and make it right between me and God. And who can do that? There's only one person in all the universe that can stand between me and God and make things right with God. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's my mediator. He's my go-between. He is my reconciler. And He has done the work for me. Now, back to Romans 5.10. This is a verse I want to leave with you this morning. For if when we were enemies, when? When did this reconciliation between me and God take place? When did it take place? On the cross of Calvary. For if when we were enemies and every person outside of Christ is God's enemy and I was an enemy of God and we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. 
by the death of His Son. Not by joining the church. Not by being baptized. Not by taking the Lord's Supper. Not by giving to charity. Not by doing good works. We were reconciled by the death of His Son. That's what God wants us to know. He wants us to know that the death of His Son was the means of reconciling us to God. The means of standing between us and God and making things right with God again. There's an important time element in this verse. In the New Testament Greek language in which the New Testament was written, God wrote it in the Kine Greek, the common Greek of the people. And He used moods and tenses and voice and cases and genders so that there could be no mistake about what God meant. And I want to give you a little lesson on that right here. The words were reconciled are from the Greek word katalasso. And these words are in the indicative mood in the Greek. And the indicative mood makes an assertion of fact. And it is the only mood in which distinctions can be made about the time when an action occurs. Now we're talking about the time when reconciliation took place. It's in the indicative mood. Secondly, it is in the aorist indicative which expresses action that is not continuous. It was a once and for all reconciliation. Thirdly, it's in the passive voice, which means the subject receives the action of the verb. That means that at the cross, Jesus, through His death, reconciled us to God. All of His elect, Chosen, redeemed sheep were redeemed at the cross. And they were reconciled to God at the cross. It was applied to them at the moment of their salvation. But it was accomplished by the death of His Son on the cross. There's not one preacher in a hundred today that believes this. But I'm telling you, that's what the Bible says. And I believe the Bible. 100% every word I believe. And the Bible says in Romans 5.10, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. It tells us when, where, and how. By His death on the cross at the time that He died. That's when we were reconciled to God. Now you didn't know it. You weren't even there. You weren't even born yet. But when He died on the cross, He made the payment of the debt you owed and He reconciled you to God if you're one of His sheep. Reconciliation is the work of atonement. Now, modern preachers today are trying to divorce reconciliation from the atonement. You can't do that. In fact, the word actually means the same thing. You cannot divorce reconciliation from the atonement. It's applied in time, but it took place on the cross in the death of His Son. Now in closing, there are threefold effects to us. The first one is, what effect does that death have on me, a poor sinner? First of all, he bare our sins, or as the Greek has it, He carried our sins in His own body to the tree. He did not just forgive our sins, He took them away. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. You see, He can forgive, and He does. But He does more than that. He takes them away, and they're gone. Our sins are forever gone. We'll never meet them at the judgment bar of God. They're gone. Taken away. He did not just forgive them. He took them away. The word pardon is never found in the New Testament. The Old Testament believers leaned on pardon. And they offered sacrifices which could never take away sin. But some of them truly believed in the coming Savior. And they were saved. But they never had the understanding that we have in the New Testament. 
that our sins have been taken completely away. They're gone. He did not pardon them. In the New Testament, the word pardon is never found. He was punished for them. And that makes them unpunishable in the future. They've already been punished in Him. Our hope does not rest primarily on His love for us, but on the rock of Gibraltar called the atonement. The blood of the Lamb gives pardon. The blood of the Lamb gives peace. The blood of the Lamb gives purity. The blood of the Lamb gives power. The second effect is that He healed our souls. By whose stripes, Peter says, ye were healed. Not only has our conscience been set at rest by the knowledge that He bore our sins, but also His stripes tell us that He healed our will. Our wills needed healing. And then He healed our affections, wild and passionate and extravagant in disorder. He healed our affections. He healed our desires, feverish and foul and wicked. And then He healed our imaginations that were vain and empty and foolish. He healed our thoughts that were troubled and anxious. He healed our memory that was prone to forget the goodness of God. And then thirdly, He brought us back to Himself. For ye, says Peter, were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. We are returned to the shepherd and bishop of our souls. Our wandering is at an end. We are at home at last. The travail of his soul has been satisfied. What does it mean? It means the prodigal son has come home. The prodigal son has come home. If there's a prodigal son in the service this morning, I bid you, Come home. The Father's calling you. He's saying, Son, come home. Come back to me. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank Thee today for the privilege of preaching the Gospel. The one and only thing that will save a sinner and we pray this morning Thou would bless the message that has been preached. May it bring forth fruit in each life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.